Welcome to my presentation titled, Where Have We Been? Where Are We Now? And Where Are We Going? I am recording this presentation for National Radiographer and Radiation Therapist Week, and my name is Michael Fuller. During this presentation, I'm drawing on my experiences as a hospital-based radiographer, and most of that was time was spent in ED. I am hoping that the radiographers from the other modalities and um, the other medical radiation science professions will get some value out of this timeline based view of where we came from. One of the most important milestones in the history of medical radiations was the discovery of x-rays by Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895. So I'm asking the somewhat rhetorical question, has anything changed? And I'm going to start with the buildings. Now here we have the uh, facade of the Royal Adelaide Hospital as it was seen in 1872. It's a beautiful old stone building. And by contrast, we see here the new modern sleek uh, Royal Adelaide Hospital, uh, which was opened in 2017. And certainly there's a uh, stark change in the buildings that we occupy. Now, the changes in architecture have been matched by changes in equipment. This machine here is uh, an early 1900s uh, x-ray machine. It's a remarkably simple piece of equipment in contrast to uh, a modern x-ray machine, which is a remarkably complex piece of equipment. Have the images changed? when Ronchin produced this radiograph of his wife's hand, he would have had no concept of the remarkable changes in imaging that were to occur over the next hundred years. So without question, the buildings have changed, the equipment has changed, the images have changed. But the big question is, has the role of of the radiographer changed and how will the role of the radiographer change in the future. Now I've modelled uh, the development of radiography into three generations. Now the first generation was focused on technology so these machines were um, very simple, very crude and uh, if the radiographer could get x-rays to come out of the tube and produce a half de decent image then they were pretty happy. Now, the second generation of radiographers, uh, and this was the generation where I came in about the middle, uh, they were learning new techniques. There were a lot of um, techniques that were being developed uh, uh, with new machines and um, uh, new contrast agents. And uh, these radiographers in the second generation were pretty focused on um, developing their skills in some of these new techniques. And, you know, for example, uh, skull and facial bone radiography um, was very hands-on, a somewhat difficult thing to learn. And um, that occupied uh, a lot of our headspace uh, for the second generation radiographers. Now I'm arguing that the third generation of radiographers were based on teams that the focus of these groups on teams, and I'll explore this uh, a little bit further on in the presentation. Now I'm going to explore these three generations of radiographers one generation at a time. So I'm going to start with this first generation of radiographers who are very much focused on technology. Uh, when x-rays were first discovered they were quite a mysterious and for some people a frightening thing. Um, it's very different to the uh, sort of common acceptance of X-ray te technology that we have today. And the machines were, were very crude. Um, they were a really simple device and uh, unreliable and uh, also more, a lot more dangerous than they are now. So I'm going to follow this timeline. So the first milestone as we've already mentioned, was that uh, Ronchin discovered x-rays in 1895. So here we have an image uh, of an x-ray machine at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. 
around 1897. So this is only a couple of years after Ronchin's discovery of x-rays and uh, x-ray machines are already in clinical use. So the first generation of x-ray machines were a remarkably simple device. There was a line switch, much as you would have a line switch now, uh, which powered up your device. Uh, there was a rheostat, um, which was a vari basically a variable resistor, which would allow changes in current. Uh, and uh, there was a uh, old fashioned type trans iron core transformer with uh, um, coil tapping on the primary side, which would give you different voltages. And this thing here was no longer in use, but it's called a synchronous motor, uh, which would convert your, um, your AC current to DC current. And uh, this current would then go off to the X-ray tube. Um, and that was how you produced X-rays. So this is um, a remarkably simple device. So the transformer that, um, that was used in these machines was an iron, iron core transformer. Uh, I've probably got some in my house. The technology is not that old. It's largely been superseded now. Um, the uh, iron, core, iron core transformer had uh, basically was able to convert um, 100 volts uh, on the primary side to 50,000 volts on the secondary side. Now, if you've ever been to the uh, Adelaide Women's and Children's Hospital, uh, you might have seen this uh, Ruhmkorff induction coil in their uh, display of historical uh, imaging equipment. And uh, this was the um, transformer of the day. One of the things that I found remarkable about this era was the method that the radiographers used to change the focal spot size. So, uh, X-ray rooms would have a thing called a tube rack, which you can see in this image. And uh, to change the focal spot size, you would um, change the X-ray tube to a tube with a smaller or larger focal spot. Now, if that all sounds a, a little bit crude, I think the setting of the exposure time was the, the most crude aspect of these early X-ray machines. So there were various methods to count to a second. So, you know, the exposures were not in you know, milliseconds, they were in seconds. And um, you would learn for a chest X-ray, for example, to flick the switch very quickly to get a short exposure time. So if you're not convinced that the radiographers had their work cut out just producing X-rays, Consider the following quotes from some pioneer Australian radiographers. So one of the early X-ray machines was known as a snook, and <clears throat> it was a quite a noisy contraption, and it contained uh, a safety feature, uh, which was known as the spark gap. And uh, if the uh, voltage rose in excess of the tube capacity, the, would there be a discharge um, across the spark gap and this was quite a noisy business uh, the sound it made was a really loud cracking sound it was quite a startling thing to experience so we had a look at uh, some of the first generation x-ray machines and now we're going to have a look at first generation radiographer education so apart from the practice of radiography being very different to what it is today radiographer education was very different and um, yeah, this quote is taken from a 1944 uh, radiography textbook and it was well understood that a radiographer should be able to dismantle and rewire uh, the x-ray machine and that was part of the uh, training of a student radiographer. And needless to say, I have no understanding of the electronics that you'll find in a modern X-ray machine. So the change in radiographic practice, in technology and in education was very much reflected in the textbook of the day. So here we have a table of contents from a textbook from 1920. And when you break this down, uh, the radiographic technique was uh, uh, occupied about a third of the, 
this textbook. And two thirds of the textbook was about technology, was about machines, was about physics, was about electronics. Now I'm going to move on to consideration of what I consider to be the next generation of radiographers. So I arrived in radiography around the middle of the second generation of radiographers. So it was around the late 70s, early 80s. And the radiography had moved along. We had the time to develop techniques because we weren't continually struggling with machinery. The, you know, you could rely, could rely on an X-ray machine um, to do what was asked of it. And a lot of new radiographic techniques were developed during this second generation. So it's interesting to consider that the first generation of radiographers were trained by radiologists. And there was evidence of this <clears throat> in uh, this uh, radiography textbook from 1944. And in the preface, um, the author states that to the busy radiologist in charge of large departments of radiology, the constant training of X-ray technicians becomes an irksome task. So it became apparent at around this time that the radiologists had to concentrate on radiology and the radiographers had to kind of lift themselves up by their bootstraps and become more independent and uh, basically train themselves. So in these early days, the radiologists were starting to become overwhelmed by their workload. And part of their workload was training radiographers. So it was tr time to pass on some of their education and training workload to the radiographers themselves. Sound familiar? Now, I saw an interesting parallel with this, you know, in more recent times in the UK. Once again, radiologists were overloaded uh, with work and they looked at the radiographers to take on some of the uh, image interpretation work. So it was time for the second generation of radiographers to stand on their own and they needed their own textbook. It's a textbook about radiography written by radiographers. Now the textbook from this second generation of radiographers that I'm most familiar with is Casey Clark's Positioning in Radiography. Now this textbook is still in print and at the time uh, it was the uh, go-to textbook uh, in Australia uh, and in the United Kingdom. And here we have a photograph of Casey Clark when she was visiting Australia in 1961. And I think it's fair to declare this as another milestone. Uh, Katie Clark's first uh, edition of her positioning in radiography uh, was released in 1939. Now Katie Clark's textbook was highly focused on radiographic techniques. Now the number of techniques in radiography was developing all the time. And this textbook ended up being a three volume set. Now Katie Clark made it very clear of what her textbook was all about. And that was about radiographic technique. And it was very clear that, you know, the old practice of having radiographers be able to build their own X-ray machine, that was definitely out. And image interpretation equally, equally was definitely not in yet. And Katie Clark couldn't make this much clearer in her 1942 edition. Um, she states quite clearly that the, uh, her textbook does not enter into any discussion on electrical equipment. Uh, equally clear, um, radiographers are not concerned with the interpretation of the radiograph and are not expected to express an opinion upon. So this is quite a contrast to the position we find ourselves in today, where you know part of our APA registration is a requirement um, to be able to interpret um, our images and to uh, notify uh, any significant findings. <clears throat> 
Now the change in emphasis in radiography from first to second generation was reflected in the textbooks. The textbooks had to keep up with changes in the profession. And uh, if we look at this um, first generation textbook, it's a 1920 textbook. Um, as discussed previously, about a third of the te textbook um, was about radiographic technique, but two thirds of the textbook was about technology, about machine, about physics, uh, about electronics. Now, if we move on to the uh, closer to a second generation text, textbook, and this one kind of in a bit of a transition point, um, we've now got uh, more than three quarters of the textbook devoted to radiographic technique and uh, an, a diminishing amount of uh, a number of chapters devoted to machine technology. And if we look even a little bit further along uh, to 1973, the discussion of uh, technology rather than technique has almost dropped to zero in the textbook. So this is a 1973 textbook and very little discussion about um, technology. Now a big change that occurred with the second generation radiographers is that they realized that it was time to separate themselves professionally from radiologists to be recognized as an independent profession with, an, yeah, with a unique body of knowledge uh, that could both uh, um, provide its own education and uh, to be administratively independent. Uh, so in 1947, um, the, after encouragement by the radiologists to form their own organisation, the Australian Institute of Radiography came into being. So the transition to radiographers being a wholly independent profession uh, sort of occurred incrementally that um, in 1948, uh, in the first edition of the, the radiographer, uh, there was a quotation here that uh, radiologists must be the best judge of what constitutes a capable radiographer. Now, that might seem like quite an anachronism in, um, with today's thinking, but that was the period that, that they were at. The, you know, radi radiography was developing as an independent profession, but was still under the umbrella of the radiologists. So that's it for the second generation of radiographers and now I'm going to consider the third generation of radiographers. Now things moved on. Now I want to talk about the third generation of radiographers and um, I've described the focus of this third generation of radiographers of being on teams and it fits into current medical and health thinking that um, the days of professional silos uh, need to go and that the, um, the new way of doing healthcare was about people working together, people working in, in teams rather than a very hierarchical structure with a medical practitioner at the top. Uh, next I want to uh, consider uh, some of the characteristics of a uh, third generation radiographer, what were their practices, their thinking, their drivers, what was the context of a third generation radiographer. And I'm going to start with what I think is probably one of the most salient features of modern day radiography, and that's the uh, existence of uh, teams. Now I work in an emergency department and I think of myself as working with two teams. Now, the first team is the radiography team. Now, uh, because of the difficulty of um, um, emergency radiography, we inevitably work in teams. It's just an integral part of what we do. But I think the other important team, and, the, and this is more the point of emphasis here, is that um, I work with a team of people in the emergency department. I, and I, by, by the second team is about the uh, the staff from the other other groups, the other professional groups. So um, I think very importantly here that you know, working in the emergency department, I think I'm most effective when I'm working closely with, for example, 
the emergency department doctor um, and importantly with the uh, radiologist as well. But there's lots of other professional groups in there who you know, perform uh, important roles uh, within the multidisciplinary team. I also think there's an important change that occurred in the way that radiographers think about what they do. Now these changes could have easily kind of slipped under the radar, but I think it's worth uh, identifying these three distinct changes that occurred in the development of radiography over the last hundred years. Now, um, if I go back to the beginning of this presentation, um, I talked about the first gen of re generation of radiographers who were just fighting to produce an image. I think there was so many difficulties in su producing, successfully producing a, a good quality radiographic image that that was where their focus was. I think if you could do that, you know, you were doing well. And the second gen generation of radiographers developed techniques to image anatomy. And you know they were very good at this. Some of the techniques that they would use uh, took a bit of learning, and um, it was quite a business to, uh, for, for example, to learn all of the skull and facial bone radiography that was uh, uh, characteristic of um, radiography for second generation radiographers. Now the current generation of radiographers I would characterize as going beyond the mere demonstration of anatomy. Uh, I see the third generation of radiographers who use the techniques developed by the second generation to demonstrate pathology because it's, it's not anatomy uh, in a sense that's important. It's what is wrong with the patient. It's the demonstrating of the pathology that is key. So radiography needed to play catch up and I think this leads us into the um, the development of um, continuing professional education. Now, one of the um, characteristics of my work life is continuing professional education. So we will have uh, at least one um, continuing professional education session in my department every week, and sometimes uh, there's more than one. It's been a bit problematic with COVID, but uh, this has been the practice for of the last 15 years. Um, and I think this is um, partly what was being alluded to by Jenny. This was not something that was uh, I was exposed to in the early part of my career. And at this point in my career, um, continuing professional development, continuing professional education in the workplace is just considered to be normal practice. And this is radiographers educating radiographers it's purposeful cpd so continuing professional development started at flinders medical center in, in a sort of comprehensive way uh, in 2003 and we identified that we needed to educate ourselves sooner you know, to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps to fill that gap that was identified um, by Jenny Sim in her article. And we found that radiologists teaching radiographers was good, but it, it just didn't have longevity. We needed to educate ourselves. Now I'm just going to change tack here slightly and, and take a step back and look at radiography in the broader context of productivity and health economics, if you like. Now, I think an important change that um, radiography and radiographers are going to be a part of is about health, health economics. We have, we can see the headlights of an oncoming train. With an aging population, uh, there are more people depending on our health system and less taxpayers who are funding it. Um, so uh, improvements in productivity were absolutely essential. And this was identified um, back in 2010 in the um, document uh, Australia to 2050 um, produced by uh, um, the Australian Government Treasury. At this point it was emphasised in 2015 in uh, the SA Health document Transforming Health discussion paper. And it was an alarming prediction about um, healthcare funding and health economics. So. In this document, um, it was identified that at the time, and this is 2015, 
health education spending was absorbing 31.5% of the state budget, which is already very high. But if you just simply extrapolate current changes in spending, the health spending will approach half of the state's budget in the next 15 years, which is completely untenable. So the requirement for um, doing better um, for um, producing more with less uh, became obvious. So I think the um, impetus from increasing costs, uh, it provided us with an opportunity to question what we do and to look at uh, you know what radiologists, radiographers, radiation oncologists and radio radiation therapists do and ask ourselves what is the best use of their time. So still talking about third generation radiographers, I'm now asking the question about what is the doing part? What is that we do differently to the second generation radiographers? So I've modelled the three generations of radiographers as a pyramid. Now each generation built on the foundation of the previous generation. So the first generation of radiographers were very much focused on um, producing x-rays, creating images. The second generation built on the advances of the first generation and advances in technology to focus on imaging anatomy. You know, what are the techniques that we can use to image anatomy? And the third generation of radiographers built on the second generation and the first generation and were allowed um, the luxury, if you like, of being able to think about, you know, what are we trying to do? Um, what are we trying to achieve? And uh, you inevitably arrive at the conclusion that you're not just trying to image anatomy, you're trying to find out what's wrong with the patient. You're actually trying to image pathology and you're at your best in that role when you're working with a multidisciplinary team. So I think the focus for the third generation was very different. Uh, I find myself in the workplace not just asking questions about how I'm going to produce images. Um, I find myself more and more asking the question, what am I trying to achieve? Um, it's not a, can I demonstrate this pathology, but what's the next step? Um, how is this injury going to be treated and how does my imaging provide enough information for treatment? And uh, a closely related question is, what does the surgeon want to know? So have I provided enough information for the surgeon um, to con conduct the surgery or are they going to send the patient back to me um, for further imaging? Right, I'm going to add, add another milestone at this point, uh, and that is uh, in the form of the 2020 document uh, Professional Capabilities for Medical Radiation Practitioners from the MRPBA. Now in this uh, MRPBA document, uh, the MRPBA identifies as a key responsibility that the medical radiation practitioner must identify medically significant findings and that those findings must be conveyed to and understood by the appropriate persons that may include um, the reporting medical specialist, but importantly, uh, must, uh, might also include the requesting practitioner. Radiography will need to continue to evolve. We've come a long way in terms of changing the way that we conceive ourselves. We are no longer just the radiographer. We're changing the way that we think and work. We're changing the way that we relate to and integrate with other professional groups. I see this as the new professional paradigm. I think it's worth incorporating the three generations model into our narrative and into our thinking. I think it's worth asking yourself, am I uh, working as a second generation radiographer or a third generation radiographer? We need to continue to find ways of value adding to the clinical teams. We don't get an invitation to join the clinical team. You become a part of the team by demonstrating your worth. Uh, 
The health system is running out of money. We will need to be proactive in finding and promoting creative ways of doing more with less. Radiographers cannot afford to have a pedestrian knowledge of medicine. If we want to be part of a team, we must have a degree of shared knowledge. Now, whenever I've given this presentation in the past, I invariably get the question, what does the fourth generation radiographer look like? And I don't think I've ever given a satisfactory answer to the question. And I think that's because I don't know. But I suppose more importantly, I think that it's the wrong question. I think what is important is that we are still developing this third generation radiographer. And um, I think that's where our focus and our energy should be. In closing, I encourage you all to remember, reflect and celebrate our achievements of the past as we steer a course towards the professional roles of the future. We play a critical role in the broader healthcare team and we should engage with that team at every opportunity as we strive to improve our patients' journeys and outcomes. Happy National Radiographer and Radiation Therapist Week.